Okay, everyone, welcome. So the room is uh, rem remarkably more sparse than it was the previous talk, so I have to spread my voice around. Hopefully this is the talk you plan to come on, and really it's not limited to post-GIS. Uh, it applies to Postgres by itself as well, so you're not um, missing anything. I mean, if you, if you didn't come just because you thought it was uh, because of post uh, you're mistaken. I'm Gavin Fleming from Cartoza. We're a, a, what I, to me feels like a medium-sized company, about 15, 20 people um, in South Africa. It's actually a tiny company. We specialize in open source geospatial application development, support, training. And I personally have been using post for 15 years. And by implication, Postgres as well. Postgres is a spatial extension for uh, PostgreSQL. It allows you to store and manage geometry and do spatial operations in the database. So it's incredibly powerful. If you want to find out more about Postgres itself, I'm running a workshop tomorrow on it for the whole day. But this is more about how to deploy it and um, use it in production and testing and development uh, to support all sorts of applications. So th these are some of the open source tools that we use in the geospatial world. And um, last year there was one guy, Murati at the back there, who gave a post just talk. Uh, I seem to be the only one this year, but it's an incredibly large part of data, is spatial data. If you've got addresses, coordinates, any aspect of location in your, in your database, even though it's not explicitly spatial or uh, with geometry, you actually have spatial data and you can install Postgres in your database and start doing extra special spatial stuff with it. Okay, and these are all spatial, most of those are, are geospatial applications that can do other stuff with that spatial data. Um, and those are yeah, tools that we use to develop and support applications. These are some examples of applications that, that we develop. And they, we do desktop applications, web applications. Generally, they involve maps, but not all spatial data involves maps. Uh, you can do a lot of location-based services and spatial operations without ever seeing a map or generating a map. Um, but often they do, that's the nice pretty side of it, is web mapping applications, and generally the data behind those is in post, post GIS. This is a farming application, precision farming, where with a mobile application in Android for collecting data in the field, it synchronizes with a thing called Kobo Toolbox, which is an open source application based on ODK by Google, and that goes as JSON into a Postgres database. We ETL it across to the back end of GeoNode and GeoServer and flatten it out and pull out stuff from that JSON into tables that can be used in a, directly in a GIS and do visualization and uh, BI with that. Uh, that's another precision farming application. All the data is in Postgres and Postgres um, comes through to the front end. Um, this is this is quite sophisticated with stuff in AWS um, and uh, in the back end in the office where people use QGIS and PostGIS to do the initial processing, upload it to the cloud, and get served as most of that's rendered as GeoJSON in open layers. But it's all stored and managed and processed in Postgres and PostGIS. Biodiversity information data also that's got GeoNode, uh, PostGIS, Django, Open Layers. This is a view of Rancher. Anyone here heard of Rancher or used Rancher? One, okay. You might have seen or used similar things, but this is Rancher. This is a view of what's actually going on in this server. So that application, this is behind the scenes. Those are the containers running uh, to support that application. Okay, there is, um, you can see there's a database server, there's um, Django, there's backups, 
there's GeoNode, a lot of support applications. Um, some of those are from off-the-shelf off open source projects that we use, others are our, our own, okay? This is another application. It's a very small team that runs the Cape Town Marathon. A few years ago, they were just using KML um, in Google Earth to do all the planning, but we helped them move over to Postgres, PostGIS, and QGIS to do all the planning. This is a public front-end view of the Cape Town Marathon routes. Uh, which is what the public sees, but in the back end they're doing all the detailed planning of um, where must the fences go, when must the signs go up, uh, when must this road be closed, all of that sort of stuff. It's very, very detailed, and it's just really a two-person team doing that all in PostGIS and uh, QGIS in the office, and that gets replicated to cloud server that is the back end of the, of the web mapping application. And so that's a relatively simple one. And that's, a, that's what's running behind the scenes there, just three containers for the, the database part. This is the database server, not the web mapping part, which is based on QGIS. So there we've got SageDB, which is a, post, a Postgres database container. And we've got a backup uh, container and a BitSync data container. BitSync, anyone heard of that? BitTorrent Sync, which is now called Resilio which has got a free, um, now if you use it commercially, you need to arrange things with them. But it's similar to sync thing, it's for peer-to-peer -peer syncing of data. So that syncs backups or static files, so anyone um, can dump a file into there and it'll sync up to the server and be available, or the reverse, you stick in a, a dump database dump file and it syncs to wherever else has, has got a peer-to-peer -peer, um, service running. Um, the DB backups one runs backups according to a schedule. It runs uh, PG dump all, PG dump um, on, a, on a schedule. It's like a cron job in a container for running PG dump and then the database itself. So if you click onto the database, you see this, the screen below there which has got already some monitoring functions built into Rancher and that's telling you how that container's uh, performing, what, what its memory use is, what its CPU usage is, and a bunch of other statistics. So just by running Rancher, um, you can do a lot of stuff. You don't need necessarily other tools. Uh, you, can, you can get a shell into that container straight from Rancher in the browser, so you never ever actually need to SSH into a server. So, Following on from the security talk that was before this, you can totally lock down your server so it's completely invisible to anyone except to your answer. And then you've got Docker container security between the containers and to the outside. So I'm logging into that shell there, but I can't SSH into it from, from the, anywhere else. I can't even SSH into the server. Um, and there I've, I've just done a table listing of the tables that are in that database from my browser in a in a shell. Um, I'm specifically talking about, um, I'm talking about a lot of containers here, but sp specifically our project called Docker PostGIS, okay, which has got Postgres, PostGIS, a bunch of other stuff in it, and our Rancher catalog that has PostGIS plus the backups plus a whole bunch of other things. And one of the other things is this thing called PG Watch. So that's included in our container, um, in our Rancher catalog. So you can install PGWatch and configure it to run a Grafana-based uh, monitoring tool on any of your databases running in that, on that server. So you can set up what you want to monitor, how you want to show it, and it's based on Grafana, and it's all built in. It just runs out the box. And you can also set up pgadmin, on the server, so you, you can, you know, just do some admin based uh, through PG admin on, on the remote server, wherever it is. And that all comes in that Rancher catalog. Um, you just need to say you want it or not, and it will be available when you spin it up. And yeah, I mentioned the backups. So the, the PG backup container runs the, the backups on a, on, a, on a default schedule, but you can configure that schedule. And then, 
when you set up that standard Postgres container, it automatically is configured to be a master, a streaming replication master. So you can set up a slave anytime you want just by giving the right connection details, and it'll just replicate. Okay, so anyone not heard of Docker here? Or containers? Okay, so just an intro. That all our stuff is open source. Um, you can go and use it, abuse it, contribute it, um, and see more details here. I'm not going to try anything live, uh, but you can go to that project, Cartosa, Docker Postures, and that's just some basics of what, happen, what the main components of a, of a Docker project are. That thing there, the Docker file, that is the core part of um, of, of Docker, that what, that's what defines what gets installed in your container. And then other things are support, are support files. We've got a lot of configuration files and shell files that um, you can configure to your own requirements before you run this. Okay, so we've got our own defaults in there, uh, but we override a lot of stuff in Postgres. For example, we've got if you see, there are a few of them. There are a lot more below there. Docker entry point, env environment data. So there are a lot of environment variables. You can override the, the lines in pghba.conf, postgresql.conf to your requirements um, in those files so that when you start up the container, it's, it's running exactly as you want. We've set the defaults to be optimized for spatial data. Okay, Postgres out the box is not optimized for spatial data. So um, generally geometries in geometry columns in Postgres are um, large binary um, bits of data. So the way memory is managed and a few other things need to be configured um, slightly differently. So that's the Docker project. And you can actually spin up uh, Postgres by the way, when you spin up Postgres, you're spinning up Postgres with the Postgres, Postgres extension. Okay, Postgres is an extension, so it literally spins up a Postgres database and adds the PostGIS extension. So when I talk about Postgres, I'm talking about Postgres with a Postgres extension. So you've got full Postgres plus all the geometry stuff. And you can spin it up straight from here in the standard Docker way, just Docker build, Docker run and make, make do your own experimentation. You can also use Docker Compose if you want to compose um, a database plus the backup container plus a bunch of other things. So there's the Docker file. And that's, this is the recipe, okay? So many years back, we would have logged onto a server or gone to a client and spent a whole day installing the OS, installing the database, configuring it, you know, running these sort of commands in the command line. Now we don't need to do any of that. You write your recipe once, it goes into the Docker file. So you can see you, you're pulling your base op operating system, which could be Debian, it could be Ubuntu, it could be core OS, there's various base OSs that you want in your, in your container. And then what do you want to install? Postgres, whatever security stuff, whatever help applications you want to install. There's our recipe. And then which of those helper scripts do you want to run against that um, image? Because you first build the image, use that recipe to build a Docker image, and then you run a container based on that image. So that is the Docker file. Um, now, whenever we, this is part of the, the DevOps, part of it. Whenever we make a change to that, or whenever someone submits, because we've got a lot of contributors from around the world uh, who use this and who contribute to it. So whenever we accept a pull request, or whenever a version of a new version of Postgres comes out, or a new version of Postgres comes out, we update this. Uh, so we've got recipes for all the different combinations, like the latest one is Postgres 11 with Postgres 2.5 although Postgres 12 was released, what, yesterday? And Postgres 3 is about to be released. So we'll make those recipes available as soon as, as, soon as we can. 
Um, so whenever change is made to those, we've got those web hooks, and you can see there's one to, uh, there's a hook to Docker Hub and Travis. So Travis runs tests on whatever they are tested for uh, to see if it actually does build or if any, anything breaks. And then Docker Hub automatically builds that image and puts it as an image on Docker Hub. Okay, so you could pull, you could clone this repository and build the image yourself, or you can just pull it straight from Docker Hub because it's already built there. So any change that gets made automatically gets built into, onto Docker Hub and stored there for the public to use for free. So that's just the first step in um, automated uh, deployment. Then comes the rancher part. So here's another repository, Cortoza Rancher Catalog. Okay, so here we've got a bunch of um, uh, templates. We've got a lot of catalogs um, that we've put together. There are a lot of public catalogs out there. This is the template for the posters catalog, okay, which I'll, you'll see now in, in Rancher itself. So this is where you define what you're gonna see in Rancher as a catalog. So there's a configuration file. We've got templates for the different combinations. So that's the latest on 11, Postgres 11 with uh, Postgres 2.5. And there's readmes and help files to help you set everything up. But you don't need to actually go and fiddle with this unless you really want to. We maintain this. Uh, you can use it yourself. You can set up your own Rancher and connect to this to use our catalogs in your own Rancher instance. So the two main files that are important here in the, in the Rancher, in that repository. So from Rancher, you point to this GitHub repository and then Rancher will show you this as a catalog, okay? Um, okay, you'll see there's a Rancher Okay, it's not showing it there, but there's a Rancher um, config file, which is a, another YAML file, which tells Rancher what bits and pieces to put um, in the catalog, which environment variables to ask for, um, all the form um, fields to ask the user when they want to configure their, their deployment. You set up in the Rancher um, compose YAML file, and then the Docker compose is a standard Docker Compose file that says what components are going to be used in this particular catalog. And there you can see the, the post just uh, image is going to be pulled, and then the backup one is going to be pulled, and the PG admin one, and the PG watch. So those are all the bits and pieces that are all the containers that are going to be made available when you deploy uh, that catalog. That's just looking at the Docker Hub page uh, where, where the automated builds happen. Um, Docker Hub actually builds them. There's another tool called Team City that we also use, uh, which is made by JetBrains to, that also does automated builds and, and puts them on Docker Hub. And this is incredibly popular. It's um, got over, over a million pulls of, of this uh, image. So when we go to conferences, GIS-related conferences, people come up and recognize our um, Cortoza mainly because they know this, this container, I mean, this, um, this project. And we've got another one for GeoServer, which is also really popular. So you can go there and just pull it from there. Um, but generally, you're going to do this in code, okay? Your, in Rancher or your... Your Docker Compose is going to pull it straight from here. You never really have to go to this website. Um, oh yeah, that's the, this is the Rancher config file, which is in that GitHub repository. And that says, what do you want to ask the user? Which Docker Compose are we going to use? Um, and we've configured that for our purposes, but it is generally useful to other people out there. Once you are... In, uh, once you've set up your own Rancher instance, which is a free open source project, um, you just run it on, a, on, a, on a, any server you like, and you 
point it, you want to create a new catalog, you point it to that GitHub repository, and this is how, what it shows you. Okay, you get a nice, a nice pictures of the different templates out there, and you say, I want to install um, uh, one of those things. And you say, uh, choose one, and it gives you a page with the form, um, what options do you want to choose, which host do you want to put it on, and it goes ahead and just pulls the images, runs the configurations, and in a few seconds or a few minutes, you've got a whole running server with, uh, out the box without having to do anything, without having to log in anywhere. Um, so before choosing one of those, you generally have to have a host available. Um, you might already have some available. We use Hetzner in Germany a lot. We try and avoid Amazon and uh, other cloud services, but you can use any of those. And um, I must also say the Rancher version we use is 1.6, which is the last version that still used their own orchestration engine called Cattle. The Rancher 2 uses Kubernetes, uh, which we haven't ventured into yet, um, but it's, this suits our purposes just fine. So you've got to have a host available. Um, there, this is a host where our, this is our sort of corporate database that's running on Hetzner, postgres.cartosa.com. It's a back end for a lot of our own internal applications and for our people in our distributed offices to, to connect to. Um, it's our sort of enterprise spatial database. Um, so those are the de details of that server. It's, got, it's running on Ubuntu, but we often use, well, this, the, the Rancher host can run Rancher OS. It's a very lim limited uh, Linux um, um, OS, um, and then inside the container you can run uh, whatever oper uh, operating system you like. But this particular one's running Ubuntu 16.04, and there's its IP address and its specs of the server. Um, you can see it's not very high spec because it's not really high usage. Um, it's very easy within Rancher to move a deployment onto another server or to scale it to multiple servers. You just say one, you know, it was on one server, I just wanted it on four servers, and it'll just deploy all of that onto, onto four servers if they're available. So this is our view on Hetzner Cloud um, control panel, and those are our different projects. In each of those projects, there's at least one cloud server, but we've got, with our Hetzner API from, from Rancher, we can say, spin up a new server using our API key. So we don't even have to go to Hetzner and create a new server, we just do it from Rancher. So create a new server, deploy Post just on it, and literally in a few seconds, we've got a whole new server with Postgres running on it. With, and and all, we've just stayed in Rancher the whole time. Yeah, so that's the host and those are the different containers running on it. A stack is sort of what's put together by one, one Docker Compose um, recipe. So it's a bunch of containers that work together to do something. So you choose to deploy, this is what you do, what you see when you click on one of those catalog options. Um, and this form you define in that Rancher Compose file, Rancher Compose YAML file. So which, what do I want to call my my stack, uh, what environment variables, what port do I want my database to run on, uh, do I want it visible in the whole network, what, do I want to allow the whole network to connect to it, this is PGHBA, it goes into PGHBA. Um, so whatever you want to ask, and there's further options down, um, further down, and then you say go, and it, it literally deploys it. So. That's, that's all my slides, um, and it is pretty much half an hour. So d I don't know if you want to see anything live, or if you've got any questions. But I've got some, so there's the, the Docker Hub and the different repositories. Maybe I can show some. Uh, 
It was a Ronsha catalog. So here are some of these other files here. So your, your SSL keys, user setup, PGHPA. So you can define what, what lines you want to add in your PGHPA and it will, it will add those extra lines or, or reconfigure your PGHPA like you, like you want it to. Um, Yeah. I just want just I'll answer that in a sec. This is okay. This is the rest of our catalog. Um, these are all defined in that Cartosa Rancher catalog repository. Uh, the the my slide just showed the Postgres ones. If you look at these Postgres replicant. Okay, that's a slightly different one that also inst installs the whole stack, but that asks you what is, my, what is your master database you want to connect to, and you just say what it is, and it deploys the whole system and starts replicating as a slave from that master um, instantly. The first time it does a base backup, and then you can tell it to, when it restarts, to either do a base backup again or keep the base back up and just continue um, replicating. Uh, so you can, yeah, this is what you'll see if you connect to that repository. There's, these are all our different catalogs that are all publicly available. Yeah, so your question. Um, so I was interested in the changes you made to Postgres default config to improve the, up to Postgres default config to inf improve Postgres performance. Yeah, there's the memory, Shared memory, uh, size, uh, the wall write interval, uh, write head log interval. There's, um, I could look at the specifics here. If you want a specific list, there's, there's uh, a few web pages that have got that, uh, the recommendations in there. Um, or you can come speak to me afterwards. But set up conf, it might be in here. Yeah, so these are the uh, wall segments for keeping senders. That's more for replication. The wall size, because you generally want a bigger right head log size uh, for, for the spatial data. And the number of segments you keep, um, shared buffers, work memory, maintenance work memory, random page cost. Yeah, those are the main ones. And they, they're quite different to the defaults. Yeah. So it'll work with, with the defaults, but really not optimally. Yeah. Uh, excuse my ignorance, I have not used Docker before. The persistence of the data inside the Docker, mm. uh, just the, the, uh, do, does it only exist as long as the, doctor, uh, the Docker is active? When you close um, it or end it, it's gone? No, it doesn't. <laughs> that would be scary. <laughs> Uh, it, it could, if you're not careful, if you don't set it up right, that, is, uh, that could be the case. Um, let me show you this one, for example. This is that Cape Town Marathon one. If I go into it and I go into the database and I say, wait, let me go back one. An upgrade in Rancher terminology doesn't mean you're going to upgrade the Postgres version. It, it just means you want to change a setting or change a configuration, which might mean a container restart or not. But you can change all of these things. Uh, and 
So that is where the data is being stored in this case. Okay, so that is a Docker volume, which is created, which, so the volume is running as a container, um, but it is connected to a host path. So your data is persisting in Violib PostgreSQL, but it's mounted into a Docker volume. Um, so the container can die, um, it can restart, but it'll always remount that host volume, and so it'll persist. And that's, you can configure it differently. If you just stored your, your, your uh, default Postgres installation in, a, in an image, if you didn't do that, would all die when you kill the image, when you kill a container. So if I understand you correctly, uh, the real data is on the, on the host, not, on, not, not in the Docker. Yes. Okay. So the real data is on the host, which could be on the host itself, or it could be on a, a network mounted NAS drive or whatever, or S3 bucket or whatever. You know, it okay. could be whatever. Yeah. But it definitely persists. <laughs> Another, okay. Apologies, you said um, you host mo most of your stuff, it's uh, host the cloud stuff on Hertzner. Uh, any reason why not for the other um, Google, AWS, and Azure? Uh, a few of our clients, like we got a client, that farming one, Scantera, which is in Argentina, they use Azure, and so we did everything for them on Azure, no problem. We just have never used Google. We've, I've used uh, uh, Amazon before in another project. That other farming project where we're using Amazon, the client does all of the Amazon stuff. Um, but Ranch has got no problem using Amazon. Uh, another client where we did a lot of work on Amazon before, it just is, it's got awesome tools, but it's very expensive. You know, Hetzner we find is, very reasonably priced, yeah. Because we, often we do projects which are at risk in a sense. We, we, we run a server on behalf of a client for a long time, and so we don't want to clock up a huge bill. Um, depending on whether they take it over afterwards, then they can choose where they want it, yeah. So we've just used them for years and we, we're happy with it. They only started their own cloud services. We used to use their VPSs. Um, they only started proper cloud about two years ago. But it's been, uh, it's been worked very nicely. So I've got no real preference. I mean, I wouldn't recommend any to any of you. It, uh, Rancher can connect, and other tools similar to Rancher can connect to pretty much all the cloud services out there. But the principle stays the same in these recipes. Uh, okay, the Cortoza Rancher catalog is, specific, is configured for Rancher, but the Docker Compose part of it, and the, the images and the, and the containers, they all run anywhere that, that, that uh, Docker containers can run, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in, I saw you have that replication container, and yes. I'm just curious about the detail how you, is that the full, post, uh, full application stack or just the database, and how do you do switch failovers and failbacks in this case? Um, we just use it as a, as a slave at the moment. We haven't got um, hot standby. Well, you can, you can do it, but we don't generally do that. We, we don't do it for hot standby. We, do, we generally do it for uh, load balancing or to have, if you've got people working in, a, in an office environment and they need to replicate a read-only web server or the other way around, you've got people editing happening on the on the, on the website, and you need to replicate back into the office as a backup, but also as a, as a read-only server. Um, but you could, you could switch to, like this, I just set this up the other day in my, my office in Johannesburg, and this is behind a, behind a Microtech uh, dynamic DNS sort of home office situation. So Rancher doesn't care. You don't have to have a static IP. And that's, there's the slave running on my office, in my office in Johannesburg. And it pulled, it's replicating fine. Um, 
I haven't actually tried, but we could switch it from being um, a slave into being a master. Just but that's not how you it. use it normally. It's just no, for no, we don't. But you could, you could because it's 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 Postgres streaming rep replication. It's not the logical replication. It's a streaming replication. So everything's there. If you switch it into uh, master mode, then it becomes a, a right full full stack. So you've got your backup and you can do it. Yeah, but we haven't configured the the Rancher stuff to just instantly do that. But it wouldn't be too much to do. If you want to speak to me, we can help you set it up. Yeah, any further questions? Thanks.